Assalamu alaikum, welcome to episode 11 of the Mind Heist podcast. In this episode, Muhammad and myself go through, talk about money. Should you want to make a load of money? Should you want to be rich? And how do you earn a halal income? How important is it? And what does it actually mean to have a halal income? We go a little bit deep on that one. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, take a listen. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here again. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Last episode, it was a bit of a surprise, and, and you're here again, like. I know. On, man. Late again. Wait, that's twice in a row I've been late. All oh, right. Are you gonna are you gonna share it with the audience that you were late? <laughs> My son is teething and he keeps me up all night, so I overslept. Alhamdulillah. Oh well. Alhamdulillah. What's new? I mean, what's new? We got a nice email saying that we put two episodes out without a gap or something like that, so they liked it and uh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a week apart, just how it's meant to be. Yeah, yeah. but it was so so rare that um, they thanked us for it. <laughs> yeah, I actually I actually think those last two episodes were really good. So alhamdulillah, I'm glad about those. Um, what else is new? now we've got a lot to live up to. Yeah, it's all got, good. Got right? a lot. Uh, yeah well uh right now we have well we've just we've just been through the the christmas period you know what a lot of palaver i was thinking yeah let me ask you in tunisia do people know right. like what christmas is and when it is and stuff um maybe on tv every now and again there's something about it but mm. as far as where i live general people don't really know or care much yeah it's funny man because i think a lot of people like you know in the uk or probably in the us it's so everywhere that you just assume everyone in the world like knows about this and even if they don't really part- participate they would like know like the date right but I think in a lot of the the Arab world, at least I don't know the rest of the Muslim world, they actually they don't know when it is, or they're like, okay, we know that Christmas and New Year is like one thing together for them. It's like one event, and they don't really know. So it's pretty funny, man. Hmm. They think it's like uh, uh, they had, so actually they think it's like New Year's celebration. Yeah, they do all of that still because it's. Very culturally or heavy, and everyone uses the same years, mm. you know, the Gregorian calendar, so they celebrate it as well, I suppose. Yeah, although I don't know actually uh, what it's like in Algeria. Obviously, over here, you know, New Year's is quite mad with the fireworks they usually do, but they're not doing fireworks this year, they're doing a light show, which seems like a cheap version, Ooh. to be honest. A bit of a downgrade. Oh, God, it's the- the money's running out. I mean, you need to get out before, yeah. you, before it all collapses. <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe that's the reason. Although, you know, the amount... I just renewed my uh, driving license here. The amount I paid for that should last them, you know, should be able to afford fireworks, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. couple of bangs. Right, we've got an email, haven't we? Yeah. Should we read the email, just summarise it? You can. You can read it. I mean, have you got it up still? No, I can get it open in about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. So 20 seconds. the gist of it is, well, I'll just read it because I've got it now. So, uh, salams, Amin and Muhammad. Can we just, in future emails, like, not get salams? Like, let's get salam alaikum, yeah? Yeah, um, go, go hard or go home. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, very well done on the podcast. I'm really enjoying it. So thank you for that. Um, I have a possible topic for you, which I'm hoping some of your younger listeners can learn from, inshallah. I think everyone can learn from this. Um, Can you please discuss the importance of earning through halal means and the barakah that comes with it without making it sound like a walk in the park? Okay. And uh, compare the benefits of having a halal income and and, uh, having barakah in your earnings through giving sadaqah, etc. And if possible, talk about the impermissibility of mortgages finance and blah 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 
Uh, I find uh, not many young people give importance to the, this kind of stuff. So we saw this email and we thought we would... Uh, by the way, thanks for the question and the, the suggestion for the topic. And we are going to take you up on it, inshallah. Um, yeah, we thought we would kind of talk about income in general, making money um, and, you know, uh, what else? So maybe careers will come into it, right? So... Um, mm. So obviously the first question has to be Muhammad like how much money do you have in your bank account right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh god. You know it's difficult isn't it because how much of your I mean you know we're both working guys mm. how comfortable are you with your money in the sense that even though because like, this thing about halal income right yeah. I'm never satisfied with any income I make in the sense of how permissible it is and it could be like I could tell you what I do hmm. uh, and it could be like oh the most permissible thing ever blah 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 but there's always I, I, I suppose living in these times there's always this element of doubt that your money might not be 100% clean yeah definitely now yeah. obviously there's there's you know there's more obvious hard arm things than not yeah I mean if you're you know working in a, a pub or gambling or whatever then fair enough but there's always this element somewhere and that's the problem like I think it's as a, uh, like to to go against the question a bit, the questioner a bit, mm. or whatever. It's not necessarily about, you know, it's black and white, clear cut. It's about doing the best you possibly can to ensure that your income is halal. Yeah, you know, definitely. It, you it's definitely a situation of it it? Whatever you yeah. can do, whatever like to the whatever level you can put your. Um, consciousness of Allah into action you have to do that right so yeah. you know obviously uh, I agree with you Muhammad like I I can't say my income is going to be like 100% clear and clean um, because mm. obviously all the money is mixed with uh, with um, in interest uh, or riba yeah all the money in the world pretty much yeah and the money is like uh, the system of money is like messed up because um, it's all based on, uh, you know, IMF and World Bank and giving these loans and paying interest on it. It's all mixed up, yeah? It's all dirty money to an extent, right? But um, that is something that you can't really do much about at all. Um, and if you ask, like, scholars about that, they'll be like, look, it's it's too much of a burden. It's too huge for you to say, look, because all this money system is messed up, I'm going to live in the jungle. Right. And in a way, it's kind of uh, irresponsible as well, because the world needs you to bring benefit to it and to bring Islam to, to those that don't have Islam, etc. Um, so um, so that's that's like just the cleanliness of the money itself. Right. But then the actual mm. job, the job, again, it's like a very gray area, man. Like if you take the money out of it, um, would you say, for example, like, I don't know, being a teacher, like in the UK, that's a pretty, pretty clean job, isn't it? If you take the money yeah. out of it. So that's, that's, and that's a good job, Yanni, you know, you're serving people. Hopefully you're going to do better than others uh, in the sense where you would try and instill some good values into the kids as well. Of um, course, of course. But, but you're also yeah. teaching, you know, a curriculum and you've got certain aspects that you have to there's always something there's always something but necessarily i you know it's my belief that there is uh, i don't know there it's not not everything you do can create you can make your money haram you know there's a bit more and obviously this had to be taken to to ulama really i can't really speak about it yeah. but i think there's a distinction between a job that is in and of itself essentially impermissible mm. and then a job that's permissible that might involve every now and again something impermissible but not necessarily make your money yeah you know, yeah, yeah. You know? like a uh, good example i read on like islam qa i think it was about uh, being a like software engineer or something um <clears throat> and you, you uh, this guy was work, was a software engineer and he gets contracts for different companies to work on their it system or whatever yeah and at one right. point he was contracted to work of, on a bank for a bank yeah so he's like you know is this halal yeah. and stuff and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, of course, you could probably find it on the site to double check. But it was like the answer was like your job, like normal job day in, day out is not to work for the bank. It's just you're doing this. And in this circumstance, you're working for the bank. But it's only a three or a six month contract, however it is. And then you're going to you, you basically your job is like not to like deal in a riba. Your job was just to the IT side. So, you right. know, perhaps it's, it's kind of OK. But again, that's like. 
a, a far from the best scenario, isn't it, as well? Of course. But this is where you can't, you know, the, this email was about the y- young people, um, they're not, they don't of really course, give yeah. it importance. So obviously young people need to know how dangerous, uh, you know, haram money is, um, how, uh, you know, really how evil uh, riba is as well and what it does to people in the akhira and in the dunya, yeah? Um, at the same right. time, uh, what I've learned like over the past couple of years is you also have to be wary of taking it to the other extreme, which makes you unable to operate in the world as well. Um, so mm. it's all about being informed, I suppose, about the the actual the actual opinions of of scholars and not making assumptions. Because I remember, you know, this whole uh, university loan situation, right? So someone, right. uh, I remember someone asked uh, Mufti uh, Muhammad Munir, Ustad Muhammad Munir, about this. Uh, he said, you know, I went to uni and I got a loan and I paid uh, interest on that loan and I'm graduated, I'm working now. Is my income haram? And he said, no. Right. So this is, this is something I actually assumed in the past, like it could, it was, if I was to guess, I would guess that your income might be haram, right? However, he said, yeah, no, he said not necessarily. He said, uh, the, what you did taking out a riba loan and paying back the riba that is the sin that is the haram but then if you're earning a halal from a halal job it's not necessarily that the income is haram from that so mm. yani allah is is kind as well allah is, is generous and he's merciful with his slaves and uh, if if you you know if you made that one mistake you know uh, that would mean yeah, any any job you get your income would always be haram yeah, how would you escape it yeah yeah i suppose um it, it really does come like to address the question about younger people i suppose it really does come down to how much they care about having halal income it's not necessarily the you know it's it's whether the preference of money or deen what what is it that they prefer more because yeah to sell someone that oh your haram money isn't going to last you mm. right there is that that can happen mm. but it's not always guaranteed that it won't last you that haram money can stay with you mm. for a long period of time and that can be your test and your punishment that it distracts you from your deen yeah Do you understand because yeah. there are there's millionaires and billionaires that all work on haram money and it and it lasts until the day they die yeah that's we can't say to people just to put them off that oh your money isn't going to last and it's not going to have any blessings in it it may not it may not but it's not always the case yes. you know but what what it is about is actually how much do you care about your akhira because you could be successful in a you can make haram money be successful throughout your life and die and then that's when it matters yeah it's after you 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 know it's it's whether you care enough about your akhira to find alternative means and halal means. Yeah. If you don't care, then, and this is the thing, and back to the questioner, the, the, the children or the kids, whatever you're talking about, I say children, children can't work, the, ki- you know, the young people that you're talking about, if they don't care enough about their religion, then they're not going to care enough about halal money. Yeah, and definitely. that's the bottom line, I believe. It's kind of like the analogy, if I make an analogy with, you're discussing with a, with a non-Muslim about Islam and they bring up the issue of Aisha's uh, marriage, for example, her young age or whatever, yeah? The, uh-huh. If you, like, let's say you come up with an answer to explain how that's uh, right or legitimate or whatever, yeah? They'll come with another mm. thing and another thing and another thing because you're not dealing with the central issue, which is they have not accepted Allah as their creator and their Lord, right? Once they accept right. that, they're going to accept Aisha's aging and accept everything. Exactly. So same here. Exactly. If these people, these youngsters, if they, they, they don't prioritize their akhirah, then they won't prioritize making a halal income. And I think it's pretty simple as that. And the, the angle at, w- with which I would approach, at which I would approach them is more like, you know, come to the masjid, learn this and this once a week, once every two weeks, yeah. uh, spend time with good people. And then eventually yeah. they're going to find that it's an important thing for them, you know. That's it. It's all hidayah and the love, really, because I've, you know, I've had it where you have to speak to people about, you know, deen and trying to raise their iman, but no one's iman raises through your actions. It's always mm. through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know. Mm. And like I could have it, you know, I could have low iman and my friends or family might try and increase me with advice and that. But then none of that really compares to it just happening sometimes it would just happen on its own like from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that doesn't compare to 
So a lot of it, you know, and I, I believe, you know, the first case is making dua for people because I know we've got a problem here where I live that a lot of kids have, um, I mean, forget jobs, they you know, drug dealing and, and finding alternative means to society, let alone the, the religion in terms yeah. of making money. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you, you think these are young, smart people that can go out and get jobs, but you know, they, they, they're going to the, the most haram means they can to get money. And it's yeah. not about them saying, oh, well, you know, this money is, is good for me or whatever. It's about them having a lack of iman and a lack of faith. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, the main cause issue. for concern. That is a central yeah. issue. Yeah. And it goes to anything. It goes with anything. Like, if there's a man struggling to grow his beard or a woman struggling to wear hijab or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Because if you compare it to someone who hears the command and acts upon it straight away, yeah. compare that to someone else. It's a level of iman and a level of belief. Because if, if you were to point a gun at my head and say, if you don't do this and this, I'll pull the trigger, and I believed you, I would act according to what you said yeah. straight away. So. But it's the lack of that belief and the lack of that conviction yeah. that causes people to hesitate or to, to allow doubts come into their mind or to, to prioritise different things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it comes... Actually, wait, I was going to say, you know, like the people that, uh, let's say they make money through dealing drugs or um, right. scams or uh, whatever, this kind of stuff, yeah. Um, yeah. There is actually, actually, if I look at it from a purely like a worldly view, yeah, it's actually kind of messed up. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of them know that it's messed up. And you'll find a lot of people that come from like bad neighborhoods where they might have been around that. They're trying to get out, isn't it? That whole notion, like get right. out of the hood. And also right. in, the, in the US, like in the 80s and stuff, um, there was that whole time where uh, cocaine was like flooded into all these neighborhoods, basically African-American neighborhoods um, mm. from, uh, from Central America and stuff. And it, it basically destroyed the whole place. The, the families got destroyed. The, the money-making potential of that community was messed up. So this stuff, like, it messes you up. I remember, you know, I met a few people who were kind of living in that world, half in that world, you could say, yeah? And they're from right. good families, actually. But they just, whatever, they're, they're caught up in this kind of, uh, with these kind of people, right? And they're, like, telling me, oh, uh Someone tried to mug me, someone tried to rob me, someone did this, this, and they're kind of paranoid. And I'm thinking, why, don't I, why do I not have the concerns they do? It's simply because if you don't get into that world, you don't face yeah. those issues. Because it, it's, it's all the same type of people who are attacking each other. They don't attack people yeah. outside of their world, if you like. And so um... once you get into it, like, you might just get into it for the money. You're like, look, I'm not interested in being yeah. in a gang. I'm not interested in robbing people, attacking people, killing people. None of that. I just want to make money. It's purely financial, yeah? But you get sucked into the whole world of it and the whole cycle. And, yeah. uh, and that's very, you know, you never know where you're going to end up. Yeah, it's a lot of marginalized use sometimes with who are after really and truthfully my belief is that it's it's more about you know the culture and adopting that respect and trying to get gain the respect of your peers and trying to instill fear in other people because personally i believe that there's nothing harder than trying to deal drugs really and truthfully your life's always on the line you're always you know at risk of other people's territory and that you're always on the run from you know hiding from police and yeah you know what i mean you've always you're always having to look over your shoulder yeah for whether it's a rival faction or yeah. the, the law or whatever. So for people to think it's quick and easy money, it may be... And it's to be honest, a lot of the people that do it are working for someone else, working for someone higher, and they're just getting the scraps. Yeah. And then when, when, when all is said and done and the police do get you, then mm. it's you who takes the fall and the big, you know, the big man who yeah. you are working for yeah. is, is disassociated from you completely. Yeah. But, but anyway, yeah. that's an extreme example. Yeah. Extreme examples... I mean, let's talk about the, the the Muslims that are currently in a job that maybe is a bit sketchy, but they want to get out, but they're struggling to find something. Because mm. I think that's what maybe the question is asking about a bit more. Yeah. What about them? Well, um, you know, I, I heard a nice definition of Iman once, which uh, always sticks with me. And it's it was basically Iman. Your Iman is defined by 
whether or not you act as though you see the akhirah as certainty. If you have certainty mm. in the akhirah, how closely do your actions reflect that? Because if you if you were like uh, I don't know, you have a job um, and it involves something dodgy, okay, something which you can't say no. It's a necessity necessity for me to keep this job, or there's no other way, or this or this, yeah. Um, and yeah. you're going to that job. If if you saw uh, Jahannam, you would not turn up to work the next day. It's simple as that. Now, that's yeah. part of the, the trial of life, isn't it? Is that you don't get to see Jahannam, right? But you do get the Quran to explain uh, how it is and stuff, right? And so, you know, as you build your Iman, you get the power to uh, make sacrifices for the sake of Allah. And sacrificing for the sake of Allah is the, is a proof it's it's a way to prove your iman you know so mm. i mean honestly i think we discussed this before in terms of how to increase your iman uh, the formula is simple but the implementation is difficult and you know uh as uh, i think it's in the hadith where the prophet says silatullah uh, uh, ghaliya or something the the merchandise the the product that allah has for you it's expensive it's valuable, mm. yeah? So it's mm. worth the sacrifices and, and the hardships and, and the work you put in, right? So yeah, and he, you increase your iman through gaining knowledge of Allah, gaining knowledge of, of his book, gaining knowledge of his prophet, salam, gaining prof, uh, knowledge of um, the akhirah and uh, the sharia and stuff. And then on top of that, increasing your, your um actions of worship you know whether that is uh, tasbih whether that is making dua here and there increasing your salah mm -hmm. reading the quran being good to your parents when you don't feel like it or restraining your anger when you you want to get angry all of these things bit by bit as you increase the amount that you're doing of both of those two things your iman will increase mm -hmm. yani bit by bit no worries i think what's important is that you get on the train even if the train is a slow one mm -hmm. You're right, because um, I was thinking, like, if if we were to give practical advice on how to get, you know, a job that's halal, right. then it's a bit dis it's a bit demeaning sometimes because certain, it's not that easy for some people. Yeah, and that's what she said in you know, the email. Not, don't make it yeah. sound like a walk in the park. No, it's not. It's not. For me to say to you, don't worry, it will happen, just try your best, mm. think outside of the box, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, for some people, that's, that's the advice they need. For other people... They have no choice. Like when I was, you know, when I was a bit younger, I could you could say that to me, and I'll be like, yeah, you know what, you're right. I just need to think outside of the box. I need to just throw myself out there. But now, if you told, if I was in a stuck in a you know haram job now with the responsibilities I have, and you told me that, I'd be like, Ahi, I can't do that because I've got to, you know, I've got to provide. I can't just stop working yeah. and try yeah. and find something else because yeah. I have to provide. So it's not black and white. But what is black and white is your your journey to becoming closer to Allah because no if you're you know if you're struggling in 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 category A for example mm. then you, you you get closer to Allah which at first you might think it's got nothing to do with what I'm dealing with right now but really and truthfully Allah is, Allah is capable of all things and if you just focus on that connection between you and your Lord I believe that doors will open up for you everywhere else obviously you do what you can yeah. in terms of finding something else but really and truthfully, and it goes back to every little thing mm. within our religion. It's always about that connection. Because this is, like, like you mentioned earlier, about you know giving da'wah to non-Muslims and they start talking about Aisha radiallahu anha and this and that. It's nothing, every single conversation should be about that. and should be about tawheed. It should be about reliance. Because there's no point. There's no point focusing on the little things yeah. here and there when you don't even believe in the big thing, when you're not even engaging in the, the main, yeah. you know, colossal thing that has yeah. to change what yeah. your situation yeah before you start thinking about making some big sacrifice when it comes to your job or your income uh you yeah. need to actually have the organic concern about your income being halal if if the concern is exactly. not in your heart you're going to find it hard to sacrifice because you don't have look yeah tony robbins made a very simple motivation is about perceived pain and perceived pleasure that's all it comes down to why we do stuff why we want to do stuff why we don't so let's say i don't i'm not concerned about having a halal income even though i'm muslim i have no perceived pleasure associated with getting a halal income 
and I have no perceived pain associated with having a haram income. So how likely is it I'm going to take action? Zero. But now, when I have the organic iman in my heart that makes me worry about my income being halal and uh, worry about the, the punishment, then I'm, the perceived pain of being in that job is going to increase. Mm. And it's going to increase and increase. Uh, as my iman increases, my discomfort will increase. And it will, then it will give me the courage to sacrifice for it. Okay, so that goes back again to, to like increasing your iman and stuff. But you know, if someone is in a this p- perhaps something p- practical and you can add to it or, or change it or whatever you want. But if, mm. if someone's in a job and they know it's not ideal, you know, they know like that they're, they're spending too much time with the opposite sex or they, they, they're not allowed to dress in a good way or actually something very common, which is I can't really pray on time, especially in the winter. Yeah, right? which is a big deal, yeah. very big deal. Um, now they're in that situation now. Now, if, if they can change that, obviously they have to change that in terms of speaking to who's in charge. Can, can I change this? Can we have this flexibility? And in, again, you need, to, you need the courage. If you really want the, the, this to change things, you need the courage to go and speak to that person, that employer, that manager, yeah, yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah? So you, the courage will, will come from having the uh, perceived pain of being in, the, in a bad situation, right? Now, yeah. In the meantime, though, it's not all about doing that right now. It's about, I'm going to stay in this job for six months, right? But in, this, in the few, coming six months, I'm going to try and find a job in X, Y, Z uh, industries or whatever, where I've identified mm. that the environment is way better. It's way better for, mm. for my man. Or I'm going to work here. It's not the best place. But I'm going to work here for six months. And in that six months, I'm going to force myself to build a, a, just a decent business, something I can survive off so I can leave this and, yeah. and do my own thing, right? So sometimes, yes, uh, you're in an industry where it's all office work, free mixing, this, this, this. You can't pray on time. There's nowhere specific to pray, all of that. But part of it, it might be that you can't, you can't find a way out of that right now. But build for it, you know, build for it mm. so you can make the jump to a different industry or to your own business or whatever it is. Would you agree? You also have to. Yeah, I agree as well. I definitely agree. And I think another issue that some people might be facing is uh, finding it difficult to balance their expectations. Mm. For example, for some people, for some people, not everyone, but for some people, it's easier to take a pay cut and get a different job that earns less, but it's halal. Mm. You know, even something like, uh, I don't know, th- th- being a takeaway driver for, a, a, you know, a halal kebab shop or something like that. Yeah. You know, I know it's, 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 you know, very low, mm. but compared to what, you know, someone else might be earning, but just doing that, right, as long as you can survive, that's all that is required because it's about balancing your expectations on what you're spending your money on. If you, if, you know, if we were to question ourselves now, what do I spend my money on? Is everything I spend my money on necessary and legitimate? And is, do I need it? Mm. Do I need to? I don't know. Do I need to? Uh, well, like I say, how I, I say it my, to myself: Do I need to buy games, or do I need to watch movies, or do I need to? You know, I don't know. Eat, eat out every day, or or do you understand? There's always ways of saving money, and then you you yeah. do that, and then you look at what you're fundamentally required to survive. So mm. paying the bills, paying rent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, my phone bill is it too expensive? Can I make you know? Can I make cuts through that? When you've changed your life and adapted your life, because if you are, I believe, as a Muslim, mm. right, who is doing his best, who is trying to be the best version of himself, etc best Muslim that you can be, then you would find that actually a lot of the stuff that people waste money on. Yeah you won't be engaged in it. And also, Islam teaches moderation as well. So, there are people that, in all honesty, their expectations of life is, every week I need to go and buy some new clothes. Mm. I need to eat out every day. So, every day I have to buy something that's out instead of making something at home and, you know, having a packed lunch or whatever it is. Uh, I have to go out with my friends every other day. I have to... Do you understand? There's always these leisure and lifestyle expectations that are thrown on people. When Let me really, counter that, they, Muhammad. Go on. Go on, counter it. Hit me. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you you you're saying something very sensible, right? Which is maybe you don't need as much money as you think you need, yeah. But yeah. I believe that if you've got a good idea of what you would do with it, you should strive mm. to make a lot of money, yeah. Of Which course. Which means you're not gonna 
which means maybe you shouldn't necessarily drop your decent job to be a takeaway driver. Um, you know, um, because I'm just because the... when you're saying that, it's like, okay if if you're like in a hunt like a like eighty percent haram kind of job, yeah. Yeah, this is what I'm in, this is what I'm indicating. Then, I'm yeah, trying to indicate yeah. this. Yeah, if you're working, for example, at the back of a bar. Okay, yeah, yeah. and the only way out. But yeah, that's what that's why like I meant. It, it, I said at the beginning. Uh, or, um, yeah, I said it at the beginning. Like okay. it's applicable for just yeah, certain people because yeah. there are certain people mm. that do that. That that's that's their life. Yeah. That's you know that's what they do for a living. Yeah. And the only way out because they can't go any higher. The only way out is to go lower. But going lower to them, the resistance there isn't necessarily about well, this is halal and what I'm doing is haram. Mm. The resistance is well, I don't have enough money to survive anymore. Right? Yeah. Then you know. Yeah, but then it's, you about, it's about it's about taking a step back. Yeah. yeah. It's about taking a step back, mm. getting defeated economically, but then winning spiritually, and then using that spiritual momentum to to motivate you to find right. you know halal alternatives. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, no, that's a very that's actually something I can definitely see happening. You know, Mister. Mr. Nightclub Bouncer um, quits that job, um, goes, does a takeaway thing, decreases uh, maybe 30% of his expenses, uh, makes that work mm. for, a, for a few months while he, you know, does some networking. You know, as long as you're surviving, uh, you're, you're, exactly. you're actually yeah, surviving exactly. and you're uh, being proactive about the next place you want to go up to. Uh, you know, you've gone yeah. down, but now obviously you're looking to go up again. No problem. Um, but just buy yourself some time where you could do some networking. You know, go to masjid, pray in the masjid, meet people, talk to people. You never know what jobs are, yeah. are around. Um, you know, I don't know, get a, get a nice LinkedIn profile, do some courses here and there, do some networking. And, you know, yeah. whoever, you know, fears Allah, then Allah will make an opening for, for him, definitely. Mm. Definitely, yeah. So, that, okay, I actually agree with you in that sense then. But as for the person who, you know, they've got a... a you know, the, really a very, one of those very common jobs where if you're in the UK, like most of these kind of office jobs, which would pay you well, but it's not a good environment. Um, or you might, might be slightly, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming if you're working in, let's say you work in a, uh, trying to think some kind of, let's say you work in a, an office in a, a right. not a bank, let's say accounting firm or something. Yeah. So yeah. accounting firm. So let's say you're an accountant. You work in an office. Now, um, th there's a few aspects which are a bit dodgy, like uh, working with the opposite sex, um, probably, mm. probably the whole Christmas vibe when it's t Christmas time or uh, New Year's and all the expectations that come with that. And maybe they all go together uh, to the pub where they socialize and they network with each other, like the people that you work with and stuff. Um, what else could there be there? Um, you know, maybe, um, you know, because to an extent you can work with the opposite sex in a way, but maybe also the way that they feel is fine to act with you, that's another problem as well. So you've got all mm. these things, right? It's, it's not the place where you can say, look, this is haram and this is, and you're going to quit your job there and then. I mean, if, you, if you've no, got a way yeah, out, right. if you've got a way out, like go for it, right? But um, right. in that sense, you can't say I'm going to go from there to a to a takeaway driver, maybe. But again, no, yeah, I, right. I feel like it is the situation where you need to be plotting and planning to get out. How are you going to do it? Yeah. Where are you going to go? Not downwards per se. Maybe downwards, whatever you know you feel comfortable with. But if you want to stay on the same level or even go up, how can you do that in the long term um, and keep that job in the long term? Uh, in a, in a halal environment you've you got to be always plotting mm. and planning and you know while you're doing that hope that you know Allah will forgive you for the situation you're in because of the the difficulty of the whole world being full of these kind of environments and mm. because you were actively trying to get out you know I think that, I, I that think, makes um, a big difference if you're trying to get out I think, I think Muslims in general mm. have a bit of a fear of being pioneers in the workplace um, I've I've worked with some Muslims sometimes, and there's this very big fear to speak about their own religion mm. or to speak about what's required of them, and it's something I might have had when I was you know newly practicing, like just this 
sort of reluctancy to speak about, oh, I need to pray or whatever. You know what I mean? People don't tell their boss, I need to pray yeah. at this time and this time and this is me. People say, oh, I need a toilet break or I need this or they make other excuses or yeah. they want him to talk about Eid. They'll say, oh, I need this off because of whatever. Mm. It's about really being a pioneer to the point where I, I, I believe that, especially in my workplace now, I've, I went into my new job full force like, this is it, this is me, this is what I need to do and you guys are going to have to change to to fit me in. And I wasn't doing that just for my own selfish reasons, but I was doing that for the rest of the Muslims that ever want to, mm. you know, work here as well. Pioneer, you know? yeah. Because if I, if I pioneer it and be the most Muslim I can be in the workplace, then anyone who is lacking or better than me or equal to me in Dean can also ease in because it's, 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 it's not new to people anymore, you know? Yeah. Because the problem is with a lot of Muslims, right? Uh, that work like down here anyway, because there's not that many Muslims in you know in Sussex than there are I don't know in elsewhere. So a lot of organisations don't know Muslims, haven't met Muslims, yeah. or at least the Muslims that do work for them aren't practicing or aren't religious or don't. Mm. Do you understand? So for someone to go in with I don't know, this is my times I have to pray, and this is when I have to pray them, and all, and and Jumaa, well I have to be there, and uh, if I'm fasting Ramadan, then this you understand? It's just about being a pioneer in workplace. And, you know, as, uh, there's that. So I believe that that angle of it is making the world a better place for Muslims to live and work because mm. it's not new. But there's also, if that doesn't work, if that doesn't, if you if it's still a struggle, then I strongly believe that the best money one can make is the money he makes for himself in terms of entrepreneurship and, and you know, trying to set up his own thing. Yeah. And that's the two paths, I believe. You're either going to change your workplace so it, it is suitable for you mm because you're not the boss of it or you're going to have to try and be your own boss or something else yeah and uh, what you mentioned about cha- changing workplace you know in the UK a lot of people I, I think that you know English people are you're generally very polite and very um, open you know and they've actually been yeah. taught over the past few decades that people are going to be different to you that are living in the country and uh, you know you should accept it and stuff they've actually been told this a lot right so when yeah. you tell them I'm Muslim and I do this, this, a lot of them I find are just really open to it and really fine with it. Of course. Um, but yeah. the thing is, you know, Mr. Abdullah, who's come to work late and then he says, oh, I've got to pray. And firstly, he probably won't want to say I've got to pray because he knows he's late and he knows that even when he yeah. comes on time, he doesn't do a good job and he doesn't put the work yeah. in. He's not going to feel comfortable asking for time to pray. So what he should do is be fully Islamic about it Work with Ihsan, exactly. arrive on time. Exactly. And then when you're doing a really good job, they'll be very inclined to be flexible because you're helping them out so much, you know. Exactly. And you'll feel like you'll you have in... some value in the company. Exactly. That's brilliant. Honestly, if, if we, that's the thing. We as Muslims take things so half-heartedly. We want our cake and we want to eat it too, so to mm. speak. We want our rights given to us, but we're not good enough citizens or good enough employees to deserve it anyway. You know, because because you know, John Smith, your boss, doesn't care about your you know uh, fundamentals. He just wants you to do a good job. Yeah. And he's not going to care about your fundamentals if you're doing a terrible job anyway, because it looks like you're just taking the mick. Yeah. To him, if I said you know, if I was working for John Smith, and you know, hypothetically, John Smith's not Muslim, and I'm crap at my job. And I'm not, you know, I'm always late and I'm always this. And then on top of that, oh, I need Fridays off and I need to, uh, you know, take, I don't know, breaks five times a day and this and that. Mm. He's not going to care. I'm just a liability. But if you turn yourself into someone who's invaluable, like in my previous job, it got to the point where I was the only person left in my department. So they needed me Mm. and I wouldn't complain and I would get the job done. A five man job, I'd do it on my own. I'd get it done. Anything I wanted off, any time I wanted off, a prayer break, whatever it was, I would get it. Not because I had to fight for it, because they needed me and they wanted to, you know, they wanted to to keep me and wanted to make me mm. happy. So it was mm. that. And I'm not, and me also, I'm not taking the mick as well. I only asked for my fundamentals. I know I'm not going to sit there and start praying, you know, uh, I don't know. Qiyamale how God knows how many sunnah. Yeah, exactly. Or if I'm doing, yeah, or if I'm doing a night shift, I'm gonna. No, you, you, you need to be, you know, practical. Don't take the mick, right? Yeah. Don't exceed the bounds. And remember that every action you do is dawah as well. So 
you know, you just, people need to learn how to conduct themselves yeah. as Muslims. Yeah. And not everything has to be an argument and a debate and then this and that. You literally just need to be the best citizen you can be. You basically have to understand the game that's being played. And the game that's being played in yeah. the workplace is that someone it wants to make money out of their business, but they don't have the time for it. So they're buying your time to do what they mm. can't do, right? Which means you're a very important part of their of their income and their business, right? Now, you go yeah. in there and you do a good job as you should as a Muslim. And you know what doing a good job gives you? It gives you leverage, which is what you're talking about, Muhammad. You do a good job, so you had leverage. You could ask for certain things and they felt they should say yes, you know. Um, yeah. So, you, firstly, you should do a good job anyway because you're Muslim. But secondly, part of playing the game is going all out and giving a lot of value. So then you can, when you need it, you can get value back, right? Mm, that, that, that's mm. that's the, the game being played really and uh, I, I was thinking yeah. um, sorry I was thinking about in the question it was speaking about Baraka and in my previous job yeah. there's, there's a lot of this aspect of haram money and haram jobs but we, even within a halal job mm. I this is my theory I'm not going to say it's yeah. you know definite but it's a thought that came to my head if I am not upholding my end of the contract, then how much baraka is in my wealth yes, from that you yes. know, from that job? Good because point. if I am, you know, if I say to, to to I sign a contract that says from nine till five I'm going to work, hmm. you know, and I'm working, I'm working from nine to five. I'm not you know half heartedly working or taking breaks here and there, and then I have a thirty minute break, which is thirty minutes. It isn't you know forty five minutes, an hour. I'm just taking the mic. How much can I go home after I'm done and think, okay, where's my money? Like, where's my baraka? Where's my because my job is halal, so my money should be halal. If I haven't put in my end of the, you know, and it doesn't have to be this job; it can be any deal that you have with anybody. If I made a deal with you, I mean, yeah. and we signed the contract and I shook hands on it, but then I didn't hold up my part of the bargain, yeah. do I deserve any baraka and blessing in my wealth? You know, yeah, exactly. And this it goes back to a, mi- a mindset. Yes, you're working for someone. And you're working for someone that you might not like. But at the end of the day, you signed a contract to be there, to work, to do this, to put in this effort. Read your contract and see what's in there. And ask yourself, am I doing all of this? Am I doing everything it says on here? Very good. And yeah. nine times out of ten, you, yeah, nine times out of ten, you're probably not. You're probably late a lot. You probably mess about too much. Probably not focused, not engaging. And then you wonder why your money doesn't last you or this and that. And, and, mm. and I've done that to myself a lot because I'll ask myself, why does my, you know, why, why do I feel like my money doesn't have blessings in it? Yeah. You know, and everyone has to ask themselves that question. Sometimes you just feel like your money isn't lasting long or isn't doing mm. what you believe it should do. And then you start questioning your wealth. Is my job halal? Is this halal? Is that halal? But really, you don't actually think about your own effort in terms of that. And, you know, that's just an aspect that people don't think about. No, just that's... Perfection. I'm very glad you, you brought that up, man. Because that that's the basically the other side of the coin. That is actually 50% of the income uh, formula, if you like. Half is the job you're doing, who you're working for, what you actually have to do in that job. The other half is, are you doing the job? Are you sticking to your agreement with them? Are you working to a good level? Are you doing what you said you would do, you know? Very good, man. Very good. And it's also, you know, uh, we mentioned before, like the entitlement mentality. You can't go into the job feeling like you're entitled to get your prayer times off or whatever. If it's not like written in law, I don't know if it's written in law. If it's not written in law, then you're not entitled to it. But you can easily do a lot of stuff to earn it, right? And, uh, you know, do a great job and, and then they'll feel indebted to you, definitely. Um, yeah. Let's let's leave it here for now, Muhammad. We'll come back after our salah break. Um, yeah. Maybe after after afterwards, we can discuss like our personal kind of situation in terms of making money, struggles, as well as I was hiring recently. So maybe we can talk about that as well. Okay, then we'll take a break right now, and we're back. Welcome back from the salah break. Taqabbal Allahu minna wa minkum. Amen. Okay, so um, so why don't we talk about like just like making money and how you think about making money and have you had a conflict with it? Being a Muslim, trying to make money, trying to get rich, trying to be a baller. <laughs> My biggest problem with making money is having ambition to make money in the first place. Okay, go ahead. Um, it was about. I've never cared too much about having too much money growing up, mm. and I think see the 
it's it's a bit it's a bit bad really i didn't see the i didn't have the drive that other people had to get rich or to get you know to be wealthy whatever yeah. and maybe some of that is because everything was done for me growing up and right. maybe because everything that i wanted i sort of already had um really, huh? yeah i didn't really you know i never was too much into but anyway, now was that because though is that because you were well off, or is it because you just weren't that like materialistic? You're not into I, stuff that costs money. I don't think no. I wouldn't say well off. I just think I wasn't into much that was that required a lot. You know, my hobbies yeah, were okay. quite affordable, and I didn't have rich people around me, so I sort of accepted my mm. you know accepted my surroundings. But obviously, yeah. now that you have more responsibilities than that, it'd be you know you do want to have more and do more for people not never really for myself it's more for you know fulfilling the needs of others so before you got married you pretty much weren't that interested in not in it, yeah? not too not enough to get me off get me up and do something yeah, like on. even with pure xi it wasn't about the money it was never about the money yeah. i started my business it was just about i don't know having an avenue to explore my creativity and to share yeah. that with the world so mm. okay and uh, what was it? <laughs> I think I think I'm tired. Today. Oh, I mean, um, what about you though? You, I'm similar to you. Um, I'm the the type of things that I like. Uh, it doesn't cost m- money per mm. se. I mean, I, you know, of course, I like traveling. I like this, but I also don't aspire to like travel every few weeks, kind of thing yeah. either. So you're right, like I wasn't that interested in making a lot of money, but last few years I've kind of changed. So I still like I still don't want a Ferrari or whatever, yeah. I'm not interested in the money for that kind of stuff, for being more comfortable or for having more luxuries or for having more um material things or whatever. Um but what I do re- realize that money can do is you can have influence in a good way on the world using money. You can also, you know, I always say time is the the most precious resource. Um, and you can actually buy people's time with money. That's what hiring people is, right? right. So that's crazy as well. When I realized that, I was like, you know, I don't have time to do this, this, this. Then I realized you could just buy people's time. So that's something important as well. So basically now I've... It's actually hard for me to aspire to make a lot of money because deep down, I don't want it for myself. Right. I want it to have an influence. Right. right. You're right. And so and it, it takes more for me to uh, be motivated to make that money uh, for that reason. Um, so uh, it, for me, it's like a bit of a struggle to want to make money. Yeah. Um, but it, it is, I do find it something that I do aspire to do now, like to make a lot of money and... Uh, you know, I've got ideas of what I want to do with it uh, when, when I get that, inshallah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not very conflicted in terms of, I don't feel like it's a bad thing to make a lot of money. I just think it's purely about what you do with it. Most definitely. I think it's a, it reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, when you watch it, like lectures from Muslims and it increases your iman and it's an iman booster. You've also got, mm. you, you know, you keep mentioning Tom, what's his name, Tony Robbins and, there's other people yeah. like that. And when I watch a clip of that, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know what? They're right. I really need to up my game, blah, blah, blah. And then it fades. <laughs> that sort of motivation yeah. quickly fades. And then I just mm. get stuck back in my cycle. But I tell you what, mm. as far as it's not necessarily about money, it's more about control over myself. and my. Yeah. It's about having that freedom to just say, to not have to ask anyone for a, a prayer break or a... You know, day off for Eid or whatever. It's about just having that control over your own timetable that I aspire to have. Yeah, that's a have. good point. That's a good point. Sometimes people want to be rich, but really what they want is either freedom or control or this or that. Mm. And that's why, uh, when with my goals, I a lot of the time I bring it back to this principle in the book called the Four Hour Work Week, mm. where he talks about like the the book is about taking control of three things: what you do where you do it and with whom you do it right so if you can control those three things generally you know you're going to be in control of a lot of the parts of your life and uh it's a great it's a great place to be in you know um but also muhammad what i found is when you're when you're self-employed you don't necessarily control stuff you know because your customers are going to have certain expectations and certain things they want 
the market is going to have certain things they expect from you. Your whatever country you live in is going to regulate how you do your business. The bank is going to regulate yeah, something. Exactly, so exactly. it's not 100% freedom. Obviously, it's excellent, but it's not maybe what people think. Also, on the money side of things, when you when you have a business, you've got your revenue every month, mm. but you don't put all that in your pocket, obviously. You've got to, you've got to pay. If you have staff, you've got to pay them. You've got to pay all your costs. Um, you probably have to keep some aside for restocking, for example, mm. which is a big nightmare, you know, cash flow wise. Then whatever's left, you're going to pay yourself with that. You know, like even if you have a business, you're still going to have a salary. No, no it's not really the case that you just whatever's you get, you put it in your pocket. You still have to have your own salary. I so there's that as well. It's, there's this danger which I've fallen into sometimes where having trying to be a practicing Muslim can slip in this notion of apathy for the dunya to the point where you don't mm. it's 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 like you not caring about what happens in the dunya leads you to be completely neglectful of your portion you yeah know? and that's wrong isn't it, it is wrong and it's difficult to sort of recognize that in yourself because i remember my dad had this issue with me at one point where because of this lack of ambition to get much in the dunya he he blamed yeah. he blamed my you know my desire to practice my religion as the cause for my lack of ambition yeah. you know because he'd say we've well, given up on the dunya so don't expect much from it if you're not going to try for it you know by the way i find this pretty common in men young men mm. they tend not to be very ambitious and not very hungry for achieving stuff whether that's money or, or other stuff um, and it, it, it's actually fascinating because I found I found myself in that position where I honestly, deep down, I felt that look, if I can eat and drink and have shelter and I'm praying and I can just like live life, whatever, I'm actually happy right. and I'm content with that. And so many young men I see similar, yeah, and they're all single people, of course, I, yeah. Yeah, but, I think um, my mum said something to me once, um, mm. actually quite recently. She said that. Maybe the reason why you feel like that is because we've looked after you too much, you know. Mm. And then she's probably. But right. I do think it's. It, I do think it's partly natural in men, right? Yeah. And that's why I find it. This is why my theory, obviously, is that that's why Allah made men responsible for women and, and the children and the mm. you know and to be leaders because only with responsibility do men become ambitious. Yeah. And they aspire to do great things. Yeah, they right. don't aspire to do great things for themselves. Yeah, I, I'm talking about a real man, a right, leader. Yeah, I think you're he right. doesn't do it for himself. He does it for the for his country or his family or whatever. And without the feeling of responsibility for your family or your country or whatever, you you just kind of like yeah, like let me chill, let me get some takeaway, let me play play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're and, right. And it's easy to slip into that. Yeah, I think even like the great people in history. Are great because they did something for their people, not necessarily. Yeah. Like I was, I, I'm, I've been studying a lot of ancient history recently, um, mm. like just personalities in, like I don't know, Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar yeah. or whatever. And it's there is obviously the notion of you know themselves and making themselves famous and this and that. But I, I yeah. always feel like that that's been implanted from us and our perspective that we use them yeah. as role models of self. Uh, I don't know self gratification ego, ego. When really, if you look at their history, it was about their nations and their people and what they did for mm. you know their families and their surroundings that made them so great. Yeah. And it's only now that you start to see this sort of self ego thing going on because it was you very. Think so yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's possible, possible. There is obviously, yeah, people were wealthy and there were famous people that were, but there was always this dialogue of. My people, my people, my nation, my country. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and and maybe that's something to do with it because if you look at the way they were brought up, they might have had a tragic upbringing that sort of mm. gave them a world view of well, I need to protect those close to me and those that are that mean a lot to me. And these yeah. are you know, and, and that's, also the, like defending your people was something which is given the highest status, yeah. if you like, honourable. Right? Maybe these days. Uh, Serving yourself is the highest state, so that's why people uh, aspire to. I'm not sure. I, I I do think there was always an aspect of you know I want to I want to be remembered and I want to be the best and the most powerful. Yeah. yeah. But you're right. Like a a decent part of it was about 
protecting their people or elevating their people, making making their country prosperous or whatever. Yeah. It's true. But um but yeah, like you know, like last few years when I think about you know, this is messed up. Or like when we talked about media, right? We said, you know, Muslims aren't that active in the media scene and, you know, you can have a lot of influence that way positively and everything. Mm. And whenever I thought what I want to do in terms of my life's work, yeah, not just making money and, and having a family, but what do I want to leave? You know, what's my legacy that I want to leave or whatever, yeah? Always I came up with the, the issue of how do I fund this? How do I pay for right, it? Yeah. Whether that is... Whether that is um, I need me to be free, to have free time to do it, or I need actually need money to pay to do whatever this thing is. It always came down to money, and that's what changed my mind about money and made me want to make a lot of it so I can do these things that I feel the world needs. Mm. So that's how I kind of ended up in this in this way. And you know what's funny as well is, <clears throat> you know, I don't know, it's probably three years ago, two, three years ago now, I, I was reading a lot and I was reading loads of business books. And um, also I was listening to a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts with uh, VCs, yeah, venture capitalists. Now these are people that will, uh, an entrepreneur has an idea for a business and if they're convinced they'll give him money to to start that business, right? So they're investors, yeah, basically. So these people, like, they easily invest half a million dollars in a few different businesses every month or year or whatever, yeah? Like, the, when they talk, they're only talking in millions of dollars, if not tens or hundreds of millions, yeah? Mm. And when you s kind of surround yourself with those people, whether it's through books or podcasts, you actually start to see that much money is not much. Like, it becomes normal to you, I suppose. Mm. And I didn't realize, but... I was kind of brainwashing myself to find that amount of money to be kind of normal. And then also, as I started to I don't know, make friends who made a lot of money, again, because they're a real friend and I speak to them face to face, that notion of what is a lot of money and how easy it is to make money also uh, became like I learned about it basically. Mm -hmm. And you know, now the way I see the world is like there's actually loads of money out there to, to make. Obviously, within your boundaries, you know, some people, I don't know, they can't network with X, Y, Z person or they don't have this nationality. It's hard to do this, this, this. Mm -hmm. But the, in general, there's loads of money out there. And yeah, Allah's rizq is abundant, you know. So um, these are some of the ways that I change my perspective on money, how hard it is and what is a lot of money mm -hmm. by surrounding myself with people who are in that kind of realm, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I suppose you're right. I guess it's... It is about having that concept first and foremost that Allah, Allah subhanahu wa taala is you know is is you know limitless, and what is what is there for you is limitless. But also about mm. this notion of having ihsan and trying to aim for ihsan in everything you do, because yeah. when it's like I don't know, it's like a a, a, a watch made of cogs. And if one cog's missing, then not everything's going to function properly. Like I could have really good, you know, I could have a really good concept of worship and a really good concept of, you know, bettering myself in prayer and fasting and this and that. But then if I yeah. don't think about whatever portion I have in the dunya or being practical in my living and in, within my responsibilities, then that aspect of my life is going to be lacking. And it is difficult. It is it is. I, th I do believe, and I'm speaking to myself first and foremost, it's about removing the distractions from your life, what isn't necessary, mm -hmm. thinking about the wider picture, what you, I mean, you wouldn't be listening to this episode if you didn't have some sort of ambition or concept of why you need more money in the first place, you know, you wouldn't be yeah. listening this far anyway, so if there is that, then then sort of think about what it is, why it is, and why you want it, and, and ideally it isn't just a superficial, materialistic thing that is like self you know, a self, like we said, you know, make it, if it's for other people, then it's a noble and ambitious cause. Um, and then I guess, I don't know, you're going to have to sort of find your way around that. And I don't know, it's difficult, really. It's really difficult going back because it's difficult for me to put myself in that position. Difficult for me to say why I want to do these certain things. Mm. But everybody's got something. The why is everything, yeah, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because for me, the why is the difference between being bothered to like try and make the money mm. and not like, just purely because of the why. If like because honestly, like I just I don't know. Like I got iPhone six S. I have zero 
uh, you know, uh, motivation to get the iPhone 10 or whatever. Like, I honestly don't want it. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't really... I mean, alhamdulillah, um, you know, things are good. But still, I, I can't I think of any material thing I want right now. Mm. Um, so it also depends how you are and stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, in the end, the true true richness, is that a word? True richness is not being needy. Yeah. You know? And Allah is the one who's absolutely free of need. But uh, it is something to aspire to, to not be in a needy situation. Mm. So that means being resilient when the hard times come you can stand it yeah. to an extent and it also means uh, not being picky not being uh, you know if you can eat any food you're going to become you're going to be less needy right <laughs> simple as that yeah. so uh, that that's another part of becoming rich if you like one part is maybe increasing your income the other part is ha- having your minimum being lower mm. yeah, I think not needing it's it's thinking about it that is a mindset for us right let's say that's me and you or whatever man you have yeah that has mm. that has mindset but it's the people he has a responsibility over and the people that are around mm. him that don't share that mindset that he mm. he sympathizes with you know if your mother wants something really badly and she's wanted it all her life and you you don't want that but the reason you're trying to get it is for her and for her happiness and for her Do you understand and that's where yeah that's, that's the bigger reason. That is the bigger reason. That, but it's also a reason that not always gonna. It's not always gonna motivate you because there are there may be some people that want something for themselves and they'll work their socks off for it and they'll achieve it. But when you're doing it for someone else, I w- I don't think that it's always a, a constant ambition, a constant motivation to do it. Oh no doubt. Yeah, no, no doubt. That's I guess that's the struggle, and that's why I don't know. It's just that classic thing of stuff that is good is harder isn't it mm. yeah <laughs> so um so if you want to make money for yourself and your enjoyment and your desires that might be easier than making it to you know save the world if you yeah like. you yeah. know what i mean yeah of course so yeah you definitely. see it like you s- it, you see like oh someone wants let's say they're infatuated with this particular car and they just desperately want it mm. and they'll save every penny just for that car <clears throat> You know, but then obviously you've got, like we said just now, you know, someone, someone in your family desperately needs their bill paid off, or they're in debt, mm. or whatever, and you just want to rid that from them. And you know, it's like half half. You're half heartedly sort of working towards it because you can't maintain that constant, uh, I don't know, motivation, yeah, desire, for someone and drive, else. Yeah, yeah, drive for someone else. I guess so. It's, it's difficult. Then you have to purely be selfless about it and. Uh, it's hard, Yanni. As yeah. well, you know what's uh, something that's hard to do is when somebody, you know, close to you, they want something and you think it's a waste of money. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, they're like, I don't know, like, you want to buy something for them and they're like, yeah, I want this. And, you're, and you think it's a waste of money. But in the end, it's not for you, is it? Yeah. I, I personally, I find that hard to, like, spend money on other people when I think the thing they want is stupid, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yeah, but so. that's another that's actually that's actually a definition of stinginess in a sense because because uh, if they want it and you don't want to buy it for them it's like you're trying to get the most value for your money if you like yeah. but if you're truly spending on them because you, you know for the sake of Allah you just let go of the money you exactly know? exactly oh, this... what about what do you think about oh do you have time just to go Muhammad uh, I do actually yeah but sorry, right give, now? yeah, just give me what was your last question and we'll wrap it up. A couple of things I was just going to say um, as you get more money, it's harder to give more. I really do believe that. Oh, yeah. People think the opposite. Yeah. So, um, what, I, what you might want to do <clears throat> is I mean, I, I, I love like tables and formulas and being structured and all that, but you don't have to do that. Like, I try and do a spreadsheet of all my finances and stuff, but. What you could do is calculate like X percent of your income Mm. and always give that amount every month. Mm. And then as your income goes up, the percentage will stay the same. And you just got to stick to that percentage that you agreed with. And then as you get more money, inshallah, the amount you give won't decrease. The other thing that was on my mind was about when you mentioned working with Ihsan and doing your side of the contract. And uh, turning up on time and all of that. I remember uh, Omar uh, bin Abdul Aziz, 
who was uh, Khalifa of the Muslims. Uh, he, you know, some people call him the fifth uh, Khalifa Rashida, um, and you know, he he was known for ruling over the Muslims uh, and cr- creating great prosperity, basically. Um, and what he would do is when he's working, um, he at night time with a lamp. He would have a lamp that is from the, it's, it's basically funded by the Beit al-Mal of the Muslims, like the treasury of the Muslims. Mm. And when he, start, when he stopped uh, working and he was like reading Quran or he's doing his own studies, he would always take that lamp and put it away, turn it off and get, get his personal one and, turn, and use the oil from that one. Right, mm. so he was that particular with spending the wealth of the Muslims on something which is not. It wasn't his governing job anymore. Now it's his personal life. Right. So he swaps the the lamp out. So that's how careful he was. Definitely something to uh, that, look up. To. Yeah, I heard that before, and it really like I was still in my old job, and it really like sort of opened up this whole door of concern for me because like mm. something so small like charging my phone in the workplace um, yeah. when is there anything that I've signed that says I shouldn't or honestly I know it's tiny things that people don't even think about but it is there and it is part of that kind of SN nature isn't it to to use something that you sort of think oh it's fine if I use that or it's fine if I do that it doesn't cross your mind it's just incredible yeah. how many levels there are to this religion or well, mm. it's incredible yeah. how deep one can go if one wants to go that far and one has mm. the ambition to go that far yeah it is a it is a small detail, but Ihsan is worshiping Allah as though as uh, as though you see Him, because He can see you, right? Of course. And Allah sees every detail of everything on earth, so it's in that sense it's not a little thing, and that's and that that matches perfectly with what you're saying that it's a little detail, but if you're trying to work with Ihsan, you're gonna take that into account. And I'm sure, anyway, you could just mention, oh, can I charge my phone? They'll be like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Asking me. Yeah. So, but, but no, it, it but even so, is. even so, there are things that other people do in the workplace that really mm. and truthfully shouldn't be done based on the contract or yeah. whatever that you've signed. You yeah, like a lot of small talk yeah. and just chatting and yeah. wasting time. Yeah. So it's, it's just about being the best you can be and just being like, being a Muslim, really. <laughs> like just mm. be a Muslim in the workplace that's all it is mm. that really is it it's not about it's don't no half measures about your deen in, in terms of the workplace and if you're forced to make half measures then you need to force yourself a way out that really is the bottom line mm. you just have to, yeah. to to be proactive I suppose in either changing the situation you're in changing the workplace that you're, you know, you're in to suit you or mm. really like throwing yourself out into the world and trying your own thing and you know having to work a lot you know on the law mm, definitely yeah we cover quite a bit email us inshallah if uh, you have questions comments you know maybe we'll do a part two if there's enough of those or maybe you have suggestions for another topic uh, mindheist uh, podcast at gmail.com right that's, that's right it. that is right yeah. Uh, Anything else to add, Muhammad? Uh, leave us a review on iTunes if you like the show. Uh, and yeah, email us, I suppose. Uh, and you can follow. I keep saying you can follow me on Twitter and that, but I don't really do much anymore. I just retweet. <laughs> I just retweet the podcast every day. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you want updates on the podcast, follow him. Yeah, and if you want updates on Emin's glorious journey in this dunya. <laughs> follow him on Sierra Masters yeah. on Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, actually, I every now and then I go to my friend. He lives in Burj Khalifa, so I snap when I'm in Burj Khalifa. So Marshall. that's that's all you're gonna see. Living <laughs> the high life, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Not on someone else's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's been a pleasure. And we'll have another. Jazakallah khairan, Muhammad. Have Definitely a... email us. Yeah. Give us your. Uh, fight with us in the emails or give us uh, ideas or suggestions or whatever you like just give us email you know yeah give email now please <laughs> <laughs> right assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh